wow, it's always a treat to get that kind of personal perspective and personal story with somebody that's been so engaged with the lake and the fisheries and what it's meant meant to those individuals. Um, so today we're going to dive a little bit more deep into what we've seen from the lakes, um, where those lakes and the fisheries are now, and kind of how we're managing them, and then a little bit of a look into the future. So I'd like to introduce some guests here. Uh, first we have uh, Dr. Maureen Walsh. Um, she's coming from, visiting from New York today. Uh, she works with, as a fisheries biologist with the U.S. Geological Survey, the Great Lakes uh, Research Science Center. And also Randy Claremont, who is here in Michigan uh, with the Department of Natural Resources and another research fisheries biologist out of the uh, Charlevoix area. Glad to be here. Yeah, so thanks a lot. Um, great story from Jim and, and, and Christy and I just touched on a little bit earlier about, about the changes we've seen in, in the fishery over time. And, and it's been what I gather some really vast changes. So Maureen, can you kind of give us a little historical perspective on, on what a fishery looked like in, in, in some of our Great Lakes or across our Great Lakes? Sure, yeah. <clears throat> So uh, Jim's video was great because I think, number one, it really shows the passion and dedication that so many of the researchers and managers on the Great Lakes have. And I think it also captured a little bit of the mystique uh, of the Great Lakes. And as part of my job, I work on Lake Ontario. I work in uh, mostly on deep water ecosystems. And when you're miles offshore on a large boat looking at all that water around you, it's hard not to reflect a little bit on uh, the history of the region and the cultural and economic mm -hmm. uh, significance of the lakes. So I could really relate to that. Yeah. Uh, thinking about what the historic fish communities were like among the Great Lakes, uh, you had a suite of species that was similar in some ways among all the lakes. And it was made up of uh, species that were glacial relics. Um, so you had uh, species that could make use of all the different types of habitats that were available in the lakes, like you mentioned, from uh, connecting rivers to nearshore habitats to the very far offshore waters where there's a lot of vertical space to use. So um, a typical community among the lakes might have been, uh, especially offshore, top predators like lake trout. And then there was um, species that uh, use only the bottom. Some of these are native species uh, like sculpins, deep water, slimy sculpins that would have been prey for the lake trout. And then you also had um, some sort of mid-level species, mid-trophic level, uh, like lake whitefish and some relatives like the lake herring and the bloater that use some of the open water spaces. And some of those species are the ones that are most affected um, through time and some yeah. of the things that Jim talked about, uh, like uh, de land development, Mm -hmm. and uh, invasive species. So all of these things sort of hit the Great Lakes to different degrees and on a different timeline. Mm -hmm. So Lake Ontario was the first to get a lot of these impacts and had uh, invasion of alewife and um, sea lamprey or sort of in an earlier time frame than the other lakes. Um, and they, they did spread through the other lakes through time. And sort of by the the middle of the, the 1900s, especially uh, Lake Ontario, Lakes Huron, and Lake Michigan, had sort of a similar situation where a lot of the, um, the native predators were, were down, and there was this uh, invasive species, the alewife, which had taken over, and there was really no control for that species. So that was when a lot more active management started to take place. Randy, would you, are there any other aspects you kind of, we got a nice Lake Ontario perspective and kind of how that fit into the other lakes. What about kind of also basin wide? Do we see a little bit of differences from lake to lake and place to place? Yeah, what, what Maureen described is a, an excellent characterization of what happened. W what some people don't realize is how quickly these changes happened. Yeah. You know, Great Lakes, 10,000 years old, but it was the last century, the last 80 to 100 years that these changes occurred. A lot of the native species couldn't adapt in time and we lost a number of species. Uh, that are now extinct from, from the Great Lakes. How do, the, how do we respond to that management? What can we do? And so I, we went through the progression of um, are people really causing these changes to our mass stack, stocking programs and try to control invasive species that have extreme negative impacts like sea lamprey. So, so, that, was, so that mass stocking was kind of one of our first really management interventions? Yes, exactly. As well as control of sea lamprey. Okay. Yep. So unfortunately that also led us to believe that we might have full control over a system like the Great Lakes and we actually don't. T today we've kind of moved to new tools that ho hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about, but the idea that we can't have a single species management and also we don't have full control. We provide guidance and direction and, and mainly because people have a lot of negative impacts on the Great Lakes but also we value them so greatly that we can help promote a healthy and sustainable Great Lakes and native, native uh, species, they're the key. 
Right. So at that time, we were, we were thinking about the stocking and invasive species control. Were we also thinking about the, the habitat base out there and the diversity of habitats? Yeah, well? when you look at the threats, it was a great question. The threats were really pollution, mm -hmm. they were invasive species, and they were habitat destruction. The first two we've kind of dealt with considerably. Right. The habitat improvement or the habitat destruction is, to me, the last piece. It will link it all. And what we find is that, actually, if you have poor habitat uh, system or like the Great Lakes is more prone to invasive species introductions. So we're hoping that th the, the last step of habitat restoration will get us to where we need to be to restore the Great Lakes. So kind of um, looking forward, what are the main, or actually currently and looking forward, what are the main management uh, concerns or, or environmental or anthrop anthropogenic impacts that you're seeing right now or that are you know, kind of occupying what you're doing or what you're researching day to day? So there's been a lot of continued changes in the Great Lakes um, after the period we talked about where a lot of the Pacific salmon start, uh, stocking started. Uh, there's been, you know, new invasive species that had really large impacts like uh, dracinid mussels and more recently round gobies. So these ecosystems are always changing um, and that's something that we have to keep up with on where a lot of our research and daily work focuses is, is thinking about, you know, how to work in each lake and work with the constraints of the system to uh, work on uh, restoring native species. So I imagine it's not just any one of those individual things, but then there's all the unexpected surprises when they tend to interact with one another. Is that right? Uh, that's absolutely right. I think the, the invasive species is a big issue, but trying to link invasive species to habitat restoration is, is you know, these linkages are very important. Um, and even today, the, the changes we're seeing across the Great Lakes, like in water levels, are huge, and we're seeing short-term changes. So we need to be able to respond to them, to understand them, and, uh, and also to look at all of these lakes as though they're unique systems. I think it was easy early on to think about each lake is the same and the same solution, but um, now we're recognizing there's huge differ differences a variety of different habitat types from small tributaries in the Great Lakes to large connected waters and hopefully uh, people will increase their understanding of Great Lakes restructures and why they're so important. So do you see, um, this is a question that always gets to me, do, do you see, you're both managers, uh, you know, you work on in Michigan and Huron a bit uh, and, and you work in Ontario, is there communication, do we, are we sharing that knowledge, are we sharing those tools, are we sharing those lessons learned from place to place to place or, or is we still kind of in our own, in our own silos? Uh, Go ahead, Marie. Yeah, I really think that there's excellent communication among the agencies. Uh, the lakes uh, vary in how many different uh, states right. are involved, as well as the province of Ontario. So there's a group of different, you know, state, federal, provincial agencies that are all trying to coordinate their management efforts. And I think it's sort of just an intrinsic part of that, that there has to be good communication, you know, within the agencies in a lake and then also among uh, the lakes as well. Yeah, and I, I would take that a step further to say, not only are the management agencies communicating much better, sharing information better, and we have a ton of information now, but also the information is getting out, and we're seeing a lot of involvement with people on a technical level on, on understanding the changes and what appropriate actions they can take. And do you see, do you see also a, a public engagement or public excitement around that as well? And it kind of, do, do people know more? Are people more connected to the fish and the fisheries than they were in the past, or is it, is it pretty much stable? Yeah, absolutely, and I'll go back to the habitat as the restoration as the example. A lot of the large-scale habitat restoration projects that now occur in the Great Lakes, they do so through networks, networks of people that really want to get involved and do something. And do you see the same thing in your work in Ontario? I mean, again, you're, you're, we'll talk a little bit about it, but you're, you're further out in the deep water, and do you see people making that connection to there as well? I think sometimes it can be a little bit more difficult for people to relate to the offshore areas than they do to the coastlines where there's more interaction. But I think generally most of the public in the, the Great Lakes area understands the value of the entire lake ecosystems. Yeah, and, more, and one other point with, with that is, uh, a lot of times we use the phrase from ridge to reef to try to bring the understanding that what you do in the land has impacts all the way downstream to a fish spawning reef.